cicadas and cricket. From crowded backyards to the back of beyond, from beach cricket to the centre wicket at the MCG, cricket is our national game. Its history and its heroes are amongst our national treasures. So who could forget the uproar 20 years ago when a revolution featuring the world's best players turned the game and a century of tradition on its head? This is the story of World Series cricket. Oh, good bouncer Richard's just missed his stumps there. Good shot. We were standing up to the establishment, standing up for our race. That's it. I think the players themselves hope to be able to get the best of both of us. And it's gone, and it's over the top at six. They wouldn't tell me who would sign, who wouldn't sign. That's a good shot up in the air. It was good time. I mean, it was wonderful, the coloured clothing, they bagged us, they called, called it pyjamas, they didn't understand what we were doing. Clive Lloyd was the one who called me in Jamaica to tell me about where he was cricket and they said this was a hush or swing. There's no garden party. That's four more. Twelve runs up the over. You can take the door ball if you're down. Thirteen. And the next thing is sort of throwing the two fingers up. Basically saying, you know, you, you can you know, throw what you like at me, you know, you can get back to your mark. Ball in, middle stop. Hit right across it. Out goes the middle peg. A few weeks ago, some of the legends from two decades past gathered in Sydney for a very special reunion. Photo opportunity, eh? No worries. They came to have a drink and celebrate the 20th anniversary of that most remarkable period in the history of the game. In the presence of this man of all When these players were primed, Australian cricket was supercharged. During the 1970s, delirious fans couldn't get enough of Lily, Tomo, Marshy and the rest. Cricketers had long played for a lot of glory and not much gold. As other sports went professional, cricket was long overdue for a change too. And leading the charge for a fairer shake for the players, a bunch of larrikins, John Cornell, Paul Hogan and Dennis Lilly. He's um, Sir Reginald Dunstan Brown, mate. He's the patron for the Royal Society for the Preservation of Wildlife. Ah, oh, well, he'll love this. Genuine, stuffed owl. Oh, beautiful, mate. It's a wonderful thing, preserving wildlife, isn't it, mate? <laughs> I think they just couldn't believe that the top elite sportsmen of, the, of a country were, were earning that small amount of money and actually struggling, too, in life. Don't forget, I'm the family retainer mm -hmm. and your personal valet. Mm -hmm. OK. Come on. Oh, it looks beautiful, mate. It's good a purse to lend it to you. <laughs> uh, I'll get the door, sir. Cornell, I think, got back to me about uh, three months or something time, or may have even been a bit uh, less than that. And I, I think that was when he said, have you heard of uh, Kerry Packer? And that's when I said, no, I haven't. And he then explained that Kerry was very interested in the idea. Where's the backing? You know, how, how are we going to get paid? And 
And I think that's basically where Kerry Packer became involved. And so World Series cricket was born. After the break, one of the key players behind the scenes, former Australian Test captain Richie Benno, takes up the story. That's gone in the air, someone is under it, and it's going to be caught, magnificently caught. What a great catch by Rodney Marsh, that is unbelievable. There's that bouncer, he's out, caught on gully, well bowled, and out. As the spearhead of uh, the Australian bowling attack and the sport's most high-profile player, it seemed only natural that Dennis Lilly should lead the World Series charge. His involvement soon had other players considering their options. And uh, as Michael Maher reports, the recruitment campaign was on in earnest. And a foot court, is he? Yes, he's out. Greg is caught by Hosea. The centenary oh, test at the MCG was the pickup joint. Any approach was to be an absolute secret. And that's it. It's LBW. Alan Knott is out. Lily has struck again. It was a huge question mark on your face. You couldn't utter a word about it. But Dennis, you in this? Greg Chappell, you'd look around Dougie Walters. But I... <clears throat> you couldn't talk about it. Um, we were sworn to secrecy. And... Um, so I went with my gut feeling. I was the linchpin for, for really letting these guys know that everything would be OK. And away it goes for his 50s, 50, out towards the boundary, a beautiful shot. Four in a row. A little later came the man who saw Tony Gregg to the pickets five times in one over, and David Hooks. I rang in Chapel Hills in Sydney, and I said, look, what do I do? You got some advice for me here? He rang, he said, you better fly to Sydney and meet John Cornell, who I only knew as Strop, of course on television, I didn't know the background and I certainly didn't know the name Kerry Packer to any great extent. And I went to John's place and he opened the door and I was waiting for some bloke with a surf life-saving cap on his head and some normal bloke answered the phone. I thought he must have been the butler or somebody. And John just took me for a stroll overlooking the bridge and the harbour and the soft cell and then the hard cell and just put the idea to me then and I signed on the spot. I didn't feel betrayed. I was shocked and I think the board was to some extent hurt because it believed that it was doing the best it could for the players. My initial reaction was, well, that's, you know, that's interesting. Um, then I did it for myself after that was easy. Um, it was a good deal for me. Then came an overseas contingent led by those who'd been paid a pittance, the West Indies. They would light up the series. The wicketkeeper was approached by his captain between overs in a test match. He'd had a, a very good relationship, Clive and myself. And he knew he could trust me, yes, it was confidential. And um, so he was just, and I suppose in a way asking, um, you know, for confirmation that he was doing the right thing. They had approached four of us at that time, four West Indians, that is, Clive Lloyd, Andrew Roberts, Bib Richards and myself. And Clive told me that he had signed. And I, saw, I said to myself, well, if Clive had signed, I have to sign as well, because those days we all looked upon Clive as a father figure. It's great for us because, I mean, obviously we weren't playing at that level. You know, we weren't able to play with the West Indian players. We weren't able to play test cricket against England or Australia or anybody else for that matter. So, um, you know, any opportunity to play with 60 of the, the best cricketers in the world for us was, was going to be a, a fantastic opportunity. Off to England for the Ashes tour, the Australians took their secrets with them. The team settled for a draw against Kent, and a week later, on May the 9th, World Series cricket was exposed to all in the media. An advertisement in the Times summed up the mood. In affectionate remembrance of international cricket, which died at Hove, 9th of May, 1977, deeply lamented by a large circle of friends and acquaintances. R.I.P. N.B. The body will be cremated and the ashes taken to Australia and scattered around the studio of TCN9 Sydney. While uh, some Australians were wondering what Kerry Packer and company were doing to their game, in England the traditionalists were outraged. What distresses me is the fact that uh, we have a situation here where an Australian um, um, who professes to, to have the best interests of of, of uh, certain cricketers and, and the game in general uh, uh, at heart has in fact done damaging things to our cricket. And uh, what, exactly? well, what will happen if, 
I actually personally believe that the rest of the World Series probably will turn out to be not quite the draw that Mr. Packer thinks. Um, you haven't been right today, so that might be the first thing you, you write about. Well... <laughs> Cricket's hierarchy was determined to stop the new chums. In late July, the ICC, the International Cricket Conference, threatened to ban WSC players from test and first-class matches. And people like Richie Benno, WSC consultant and commentator, were dubbed disapproved persons. What right has the International Cricket Conference to say to the sporting public of Australia that my wife and I are disapproved people. With the Ashes lost, World Series bosses decided to do what players became famous for in their games. They went on the attack, challenging the ICC's ban in the High Court. The lawyers and critics had had their say, but ultimately, the public would be the judge. After the break, it's season one. Showtime for World Series cricket. <laughs> ah! Oh, he's done him! He's done him, he's hit his stumps. Marsh has... Thomas King has hit down his stumps. This is out. It's Berg up, I confirm. I think we'll see the finger go up here. I think he's got to be out because there's a fearful clump of willow on Ash. was going to happen to us that was the question on every player's mind as he went to sleep in the latter part of that tour I mean is it going to be all right I mean are we is this going to really work out I mean we have got ourselves in the in the shit here haven't we I mean let's be right, really honest indeed the uh, WSC recruits were in a predicament denied access to traditional grounds like the SCG even more disastrously they had no pitches on which to play or did they idea when I was in Brisbane that it'd be nice to lay wickets in huge slabs. It had never been done before. I didn't know how to do it. And when World Series started, I thought, yeah, that's the way, you know, because I was racking my brain. When I started to see on television, you know, the, they were making the, the pitches, John Maley was making the pitches in, in the cement trays in Melbourne and you know, he was working hard at the Sydney showground uh, with his chicken wire and producing pitches there, you see. That's about the time I started to think to myself, this might actually get off the ground. There were so many conventions broken. Johnny Maley, for example, was growing not just grass, but wickets, full-blown, three-dimensional wickets. And within a week, we were actually using that surface to play the first super test. How could you refuse to prepare pitches for the best players in the world for a competition like that? And he's out. Bakoska is gone. Vivian Richards has caught him at third slip. The hook from Ian Chappell. 
And a very, very good shot. That's out. That is plum. Granitz doesn't look too happy about it. Oh, and there's a great shot down the ground off the back foot. Didn't move. He punched that high over mid iron. And again, there she goes again. A great shot. This time through mid wicket. That's a Bradman type shot. Well forward of the square umpire. Great, great shot. It didn't even make any difference to me when we started out playing World Series cricket and there were only a handful of people in some of the stadiums. Because I've always said that uh, it, was the, it was the competition that got me going. If the game was competitive, then I was into it. That's a good shot from Chapel. The vacant area there at mid-on. Gosh, we could have been in the country. It, was, it looks pretty naked when there's no one in the stand. I mean, every, every little ball on Willow, she just echoed around the ground. I think there were more seagulls than people there to start with. in the end. Yeah, that's well bowled, and it's out. A very, very good piece of bowling, that from Max Walker. For the record, uh, only 13,000 spectators turned up at uh, VFL Park to see the West Indies win that super test in a low-scoring game. At the same time, in Brisbane, more than 32,000 were watching the establishment Australians winning at the Gabba against India. On all accounts, it was a shaky start, with critics gleefully predicting a short life for the new venture. But not so for the Windies, who were relishing the novelty of winning on Australian soil. And that's a mighty hit by Clive Lloyd. Picked it up and it sailed high and just over the boundary. The crowd signaling six, and that is a six. That's a mighty hit by Clive Lloyd. He'll come for the second, the return is on the way, he'll have to hurry. There's an appeal for run out, but Walter just makes it. And he's bowled in, he's gone, Walker again. The West Indians were, were known as, as the great entertainers, you know, people used to love uh, the Calypso cricketers were coming to Australia or England and and teams loved playing against us, particularly because they would win. We would do the entertaining and they would win, so it was, was great for them. And um, all of a sudden, we, we changed the attitude in, in World Series cricket. And it's in the air, and Julian just can't get there. Diving forward, and just couldn't get there. You played a super test against um, Andy Roberts, Michael Holding, Joel Garner and Colin Croft. And when that was over, uh, you then went and played a uh, one-day international and you played against Andy Robertson, Michael Holding and Joel Garner and uh, Wayne Daniel and Colin Croft. And uh, there's an appeal for a quarter of the wicket. Not out, says the umpire. He's flashing out outside the off stump. The West Indies is disgusted. Ball in. Ball pass. Hit the leg stump. Wayne Daniel with his fourth wicket. Superb performance by this young West Indian. West Indies had never won a series in Australia before, official, unofficial, whatever. So, yeah, there, there was great pride in us winning. In the air, out. It's all over. The West Indies have won. The West Indies have won an amazing cricket match by 25 runs. West Indies are 124. Australia all out for 99. As the show moved on to Sydney for the second super test, the West Indies had the Australians looking for some answers. Standing up to the pace bowling tornado would call for some real courage at the crease. A great shot. Won't quite go for four. Collis King will pull it up just inside the boundary. And this is another one. That's another four for Hooks. They won't catch this one. Into the boundary. Five fours and a two off the over. 22 in all. And the crowd is delirious. But the risk of injury was never far away. Amni Roberts here, the most experienced of the West Indian fast bowlers. And a great fast bowler in his own right. Coming on to see if he can put the break on.
And he's in trouble. I mean, I wish it happened to somebody else. I wish it was happening to Marshy at the other end and not me. I mean, I don't want to be the one that is remembered for stimulating the growth of helmets in this country. But I think it was, if you take my name out of that discussion, I think the fact that World Series again was innovative in a different area, I think that's quite amazing. My reaction was sort of stunned for a second. And Marsh said, mate, he said, I know where there's a good panel shop can fix up that hat for you. We were now professional cricketers, and by getting whacked in the head, uh, it might cost you six weeks. Uh, if you were out for six weeks, then uh, you know, your employer wasn't a pleased person. And Rod Marsh just about to throw it up. Oh, it's hit him. Hit him somewhere around about the shoulder or neck. Oh! No comment needed. And he just sort of nodded his head like that, and I thought, gee, you know, it's incredible. And the next thing, he's sort of thrown the two fingers up, basically saying, you know, you, you can uh, throw what you like at me, you know, you can get back to your mark. From a West Indian point of view, it was bad for us because it meant that the batsmen had some protection. But uh, from our point of view, when we had to face Lily and Pasco and people like that, it, it was a great innovation, yeah. Like most innovations, helmets did generate some teething problems, not uh, least of which was hearing the call when running between the wickets. Here's the gun, she has to run at the ball as Andy will be out. Committing suicide here with bad calling there. Greg didn't respond to not call. And he's draw. He's gone. He's gone. Magnificent. Well, that was a third attempt there. Uh, the West Indies seem to be doing it uh, like jugglers today. I think what one of the things that World Series cricket did, certainly through the, the television coverage, was bring it a lot closer to spectators. You know, people actually began to feel that they just weren't watching, you know, gladi gladiators out on, on the field. But they were actually part of, of what was happening. Yes, uh, it was a whole new deal for the viewing public. And one of the promises of World Series cricket was that it would pit the best against the best. And that's his 150, lifted it over the top for four. That's a great shot. Pulled away in front of Square Leg by Chapel. He was very quickly in the position for that. And that's a short bouncer. Greenwich stands there as well, he might. Oh! If anyone thought that World Series cricket was just exhibition games, you know, <laughs> must have convinced them that these games are very full on. Robinson hit on the left arm there. They were fearsome. I mean, uh, Roberts, for me, ranks alongside Lily as, uh, as the toughest fast bowler. They could just keep going. You throw a holding in there as a, a really super fast bowler and all the backup they had as well. Uh, they were fearsome. And, you know, so were the Australians. I mean, we, we're talking about playing what some of the batsmen in the world consider to be the toughest cricket ever. Tony Gregg has caught Bernard Julian. There were just no easy runs, no let up. And if you were struggling for form, heaven knows how you were going to get back into form. Chance! It's gone! Loose shot from Barry Richards. They were trying to get you and we were trying to get them. And uh, that, I mean, it was competitive. That's why the cricket was so good.
the big change was night cricket. That was, that was the thing that really turned it for World Series cricket. And it's Len Pascoe to bowl the first ball to Barry Richards. And the first ball under lights. In the history of Australian cricket is a no ball. The first night game at uh, VFL Park at Waverley, um, there was quite a good crowd turned up uh, at the start of play. That's out. Yes. Ian Chappell, a fine catch. Dennis Amos playing away from his body. And Came back out to play the second session. Suddenly, the ground was, you know, there was 38, 39,000 people there. Lots of fielders coming for it, and Greg Chappell just can't get there in time. Oh, behind. And to me, I think that was the, the day come night that we all felt, hello, this thing has turned around. Turning on the lights wasn't the only switch for day-night cricket. For players and spectators to follow the action after dark, the ball would need a change of colour. missed in the lights but taken eventually by the fielder at mid on Mick Malone he lost it in the lights you could see that he didn't pick it up was looking all over the place for it gee I remember the night we went out to VFL Park he talked about research we had a cardboard box not much bigger than around about less than a metre square every colour cricket ball imaginable for mankind we got iridescent green yellow orange red pale pink, blue, white, red. And I don't know, I just couldn't imagine Joel Garner or uh, Michael Holding or Andy Roberts out of a black side screen with any colour ball in the hand that was going to be a success. Ultimately, after exhaustive tests, white was the colour. By match two, played the following night, both players and fans were beginning to appreciate the dramatic atmosphere of cricket under lights. Australia playing a lot better in the past week or so. Beautifully fielded, magnificent. Ian Davis, the fielder. Thou shalt not pass. Well, that one cut back. I don't think Greenwich expected it to cut back as much as it did. And this could be close. Greenwich run out, beautiful bit of feeling by Gary Gilmore. The West Indies are one for 18. Uppish just falling short of Ian Davis. single to Jim Allen. Good running. And good cricket from Marsh. A long way to come from that wicket-keeping position. And quite rightly, he's asking where was the fellow standing by the stumps at the bowler's end. Decisive wicket, out for 30, caught Walker, bowl by Bright, 7 for 169. Leg by, very quickly taken here. He's home, but a good bit of fielding. And he's caught him. Andy Roberts has gone. Ray Bright again, and what a good day he's had, and an even better night. Chapel, it'll just be one. It's 
few balls remaining, five needed. Wayne Daniel has strike. Well, Wayne isn't, uh, and he'll admit to this, the, the best batsman in the world. So getting himself into a position where he had to hit a six off the last ball, uh, you know, it's like winning the lottery. Well, they've had their conference. They will have decided that or that Wayne Daniel goes for the doctor with this second last delivery in Malone. It had been a wild ride, but uh, by the end of that first season, the public had developed an appreciation of what World Series cricket had to offer. The off-season provided a chance to develop a winning strategy that was both on and off the field. <laughs> and uh, both into the ground, and there are the two keepers together, having a good laugh about it. Here it is again. Very unusual happening this into the ground up it goes come back comes Murray and just knocks it away <laughs> leg like stump they'll go for a single here and the ball hits the stumps but well home and overthrows so what confusion <laughs> all sorts of madness going on Players and the product were in place. Now it was simply a matter of public acceptance. I mean, gosh, to be honest, huge six light pylons, floodlit, coloured gear, uh, the chant, come on, Aussie, come on, come on. I mean, that was electric come stuff. On, come on. Actually got, as I say, got it done by Mojo. That's a little bit, yeah, a little bit. Down it down like a machine. Lily's pound and down like a machine. Pascal's I can't see the words here, man. Pascal's making divots in the green. He rang me up and said, "Mate, have a listen to this." And on the phone. He played, come on, Aussie, come on. The first time I heard it, I thought, oh, shit. Now, can you imagine on the phone, like, not that. I thought, oh, yeah, OK, good. And I said, could you play it again? And he played it again, and I played it, heard it three or four times, and then you could, it's just so catchy. And um, then he sent me a tape over, and I played it on stereo. It's fantastic. Oh, with uh, a few minor hiccups, the players were more than ready to embrace the changes. Who would the fans be willing to follow? In season two, with World Series at last fairly permitted access to one of the game's traditional arenas, the ingredients finally came together on one magical evening in Sydney, November 28, 1978. And what a sight it is here at the Sydney Cricket Ground. Play some uh, six or seven minutes away from uh, restarting the second session. John Cornell came in the room and said, Dennis, 
come upstairs, went upstairs, and we walked into a little executive room up the top of the uh, SCG, and out the back there's a window, and, and you can see out the back, and there was files of people, like th thousands of people in lines trying to get in. And Kerry Packer took Cornell and I across to the, uh, the window and said, have a look at that. And we look, as we looked, he said, we've made it. And I remember when we walked on, there was a huge crowd there and they'd been singing, come on, Aussie, come on. And there was a fantastic atmosphere. And as we walked through the gate onto the Sydney cricket ground, I remember Rodney Marsh saying, we're back. Jet, which is a small plane with all the players coming back from the bush and the pilot said apparently the scenes around the Sydney Creek ground are just incredible. Appeal for a catch, he's gone. Ian Chappell out Port Murray. Quick single, having to hurry and he's hit the stuff, he's gone. Those images from that memorable night offered a wonderful glimpse into the future of cricket. The product was there. However, what had gone before hadn't really done the right thing by the product. It had all been so conservative, you know, turn up to Lords and, you know, go out there in white and it's pretty the same each year. But uh, we did bring it to life. We switched the lights on at night. I mean, it was wonderful. The coloured clothing, they bagged us, they called, called it pyjamas. They didn't understand what we were doing. You can't play night cricket with a white ball and wear white clothes. I mean, it's just not possible. We found all that stuff out. The Australians out in their gold colours. And to be quite frank, even though I was saying that I didn't like the West Indian colours because they were too really outlandish for my liking, the Australian gold has really shown up beautifully out there this evening. We never expected that we, of all people, would end up in, in pink uniforms. That's for now Lloyd, the batsman. Good bounce from Pasco. Appeal. And uh, Lily this time is a lot more confident, but I reckon that's a bit high in Richard Austin. <laughs> I think the West Indies were pretty uh, unhappy with pink, but... <laughs> I don't think it was catchable. I think it bounced in front of Alan Knott. It certainly went between Knott and Barry Richards at first slip. And that's uh, <laughs> also a little bit uh, funny, although I don't know if David Hook thinks so. I think that the World Eleven's pale blue looked absolutely wonderful. Lights, white balls, coloured clothing, capacity crowd. The world's best players engaged in an exciting limited overs format. Meanwhile at home, a vast audience was enjoying the game as they'd never seen it before. It came courtesy of a TV coverage and a range of ingenious ideas developed here in Australia 
and eventually adopted by sports telecasters around the world. The revolution had made its mark. Next, reconciliation. It's the Rowan. And he's got him. What a breakthrough for the Australians. And Vivian Richards has been given out. Marsh must have clung onto the ball. I'm not certain that World Series cricket, and I've said this on many occasions, was a bad thing for cricket anyway. I think that it brought the Australian cricket board ahead in two years or three years what may have taken it 30 years uh, and may never have happened. World Series cricket came along and I agreed to play because I agreed with the principle of it all and I thought this is the this is the opportunity. The players have got an opportunity here to stand up and be counted and to strike a blow against the cricket boards. I mean, for all these years, they'd had all the cards were stacked in their favour. Suddenly, we'd been dealt a couple of aces and maybe even a joker. So, boy, ask for the catch. I think he's got him. Beautiful bowling. There's no doubt that, that one day cricket has been the lifeline over the last 20 years, which, which has kept, kept cricket very viable and enabled the players, not only the players, but all the states, to be able to get healthy revenue to develop the game. And there's a big appeal. Yes, and he's given him. Oh, that's uh, tremendous fielding. We were part of a revolution which changed the face of the game, hopefully for the better, and I think it has been for the better, and uh, I'm just very proud to be part of that. This country, Australia, is the most cosmopolitan country in the world. And it has a population of millions of people that were not raised in the cricket tradition that can understand limited over cricket better than they can understand test cricket. They're learning to understand test cricket. Test cricket figures are improving and they will continue to improve because of limited over cricket. Now, to whom do you attribute that? And I go back to World Series cricket. We started off having a war with the cricket board. We ended up being friends with them, and between them, them and us, I think we've ended up doing a service for cricket, which has been good for the game, good for the individuals, and good for the general public. So two decades after those turbulent but exciting times, the Larrikans, the individuals who led the way, deserve credit for changing the course of cricket history, adding life and vigour to what Sir Donald Bradman calls the most wonderful game of all. a presentation of nines wine